Fukushima to map and measure um, radioactivity. It has like, I don't know how many, 50 million um, data points logged. This is the growth over time. This is a really cool device for measuring um, activity in, uh, in your nervous system. Um, so much cool stuff. This is for measuring your brain. That's a device that I worked on for measuring photosynthesis. Really great stuff. It's out there and it's open source. So that's not in my little bucket that you can't look in either. In the sensor space, the technology itself is of decreasing relevance, right? A lot of new sensors that are coming out aren't magic new technology like they can see something new. What they're actually doing is they're taking the same old technology, they're making it cheaper, and then they're building big databases so that they can correlate that simple stuff to something complicated. It's all about building a reference library to correlate something simple to something complex. And that means all the cost moves from developing the widget to making the widget tell you something useful. Right? Again, that's about collecting data. I can collect data, but pretty sure you guys can collect data too. And in fact, you're in the places where the data should be collected. You're on the farms, right? You're in the stores that I would have to pay someone $20 an hour to go collect. And you guys are doing it as part of your daily process. So there's another thing that's not in my little bucket. And then finally, manufacturing. This is the one you probably already know. Um, crowdsourcing manufacturing is like what everybody does now, especially for consumer products. So it used to be I had to go get a loan for $10 million to make my 100,000 widgets. And now I can go crowdsource that $10 million and deliver it to you in a year or two, or if I'm late, four, depending on which Kickstarter campaign you supported. But you get the idea. Um, so what used to be, all of this stuff used to be in my bucket. And I could hide it from you, and I could charge you a bunch of money for it. And now all of this stuff, if you choose to engage it, it's kind of in your hands, community. right? Like, you have the capacity to control your technological futures. You just haven't realized it yet. So why are we doing this? There's no reason. This is stupid. <laughs> so stop doing it, please. Um, we need to move something that's like this. I'm not saying I'm worthless as a developer. I think I bring some value. I think Mike brings some value. I think we do good work. But we don't need to dictate the terms on which we're interacting with you. We should be partnering directly with communities so that we're building the thing that you actually want and need and not building the thing that produces the highest amount of profit or whatever. I have, we, developers have a variety of motivations that may not be consistent with yours. Now, not, it's not a judgment call, it's just difference. So this is what I want to move to. Um, I was going to give an example, but I'm going to skip it. So this is soil carbon. It's an example that you can walk through all this and see that people actually do have a lot of power. But here's my point. You have the technology, right? We have the skills. We have the people. We now have the capital. And in the case of binutrient meter, we are working on the proof of concept. I think we have good reason to believe that we can achieve that. So like, this is you, community. Like, you think you're this, but you're actually that. Uh, and, 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 and you know, the other thing that's changed is before, if you wanted to say, oh, well, we're going to do this kind of distributed collaborative development process, um, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we just didn't have the tools to do it. Just simple crap like Google Docs, you know, like version control. Like there's just things now that we have that would make that kind of distributed development really hard to do. Um, the internet, you know, like stuff like that. And now we can do it. So the problem is that working together is really hard at first. <laughs> so like we're going to say, oh, we're going to collaboratively develop this tool. And like this is what it feels like on day one. Because like I'm like, well, I know what to do. And you're like, well, I know what to do. And like, hey, did you save over my this? And hey, this is wrong. And like, there's a process to which we become skilled at working together in a collaborative way. And those are just skills that, as a community, we have to build. Just like you do in your job, just like you do in your family and your marriages. They're just skills we have to build. 
We haven't had the capacity to build them yet. Now we can. So, like, we can do something cool. Um, and that's my hope. So, uh, so that's the intro. You are in control of your technological futures, but it also means that you have some responsibility to that process. Um, and I hope that by the end of the day, you have really clear connection points for how and where you can plug in. Um, whether that be, you know, in some cases people can donate money, great. In other cases people can act as um, beta testers and super users. That's so, so, so important to the process. In other cases, you know, people have development skills that they can contribute to the process. There's lots of ways that you can be involved, um, and we need that involvement. And you need that involvement to get the thing that you want. Um, so that's the first part of the shtick. So, um, okay, so let's now, like, that's great, big vision. Uh, but how does that relate to the BFA? We're specifically talking about this bionutrient meter, right? That's the, that's the sort of technological future that we're, that we're engaged in. Um, so we're going to talk through about uh, what we're doing, how we got here, and where we're going to go. So this is our first little prototype. Um, we started working on this about, we started actually designing it about six or seven, seven months ago, I guess. Um, we started thinking about it about a year ago. Um, so uh, it's a silly looking little device right now. Um, this is a device that I made before called the Multispec. Um, it's now like professionally manufactured and injection molded all fancy looking. So don't, don't fret. <laughs> things, <laughs> things improve over time. Everything looks ugly at first. Uh, it's okay. Uh, in fact, uh, in the proof of concept phase, the most important thing is spending the least amount to, to prove that something works. So if you have a fancy proof of concept, then you've probably done something wrong. So <laughs> we definitely did something right here. Um, uh, so, so how does this work? So this is, uh, it's quite zoomed in. Okay. So how does this work? So I'm going to talk about the strategy, the sort of tech strategy that we chose, uh, a little bit about why why we chose it and why we think it's the right strategy. So our strategy is to use reflectance spectroscopy, which I'm going to explain, uh, and then a reference library to actual lab-based measurements, standard nutritional measurements, um, and combining those things, be able to predict those lab-based measurements. So use a spec to predict lab-based measurements. Um, so when I say reflectance spectroscopy, what do I mean? Well, you've got a little device that shoots out light in specific, at specific wavelengths, and then it measures the light that bounces back off um, and sees how much of it was dissipated and how much came back. It's pretty straightforward. It's like looking at something. <laughs> it's like looking at something if you had two lights right next to your eyes. Um, so in the, in the literature, or historically, this has been done with full spectra. So that means you get to see uh, you know, everything from, from UV all the way up to infrared and everything in between. And that's um, one more expensive, rather expensive, though it's coming down in cost, but it's still expensive. And two, uh, it requires an, an outside light source um, in order to do, or it, it uses the, the external light in order to do well, and that sort of confuses the response because if you're in fluorescent lights versus sunlight, you're going to get a different response because those have different, they look different. Um, so what we're doing instead is, instead of taking the full spectra, what we found is that you don't really need the full spectra. That's like overkill in terms of information. So it's not worth the cost. So we just have a couple of LEDs at some key wavelengths, and we shoot those LEDs at the apple, and then we only look at the light that came back from that specific LED. So if it's sunny outside, it doesn't matter. We're not seeing the sun. We're only seeing the LED that we just flashed and got back. That means it's more robust in field conditions or in the store or wherever you are to external light. Uh, and it also simplifies the response because a lot of data is great, but it's only great if it's useful. A lot of data is actually just frustrating if you have to pick through it, if it's not useful. So this helps us refine the data a little bit to make it easier to analyze. So um, that's our strategy. So we're going to take this, a big database of this data plus actual lab data, and that's what 
David's going to talk about which pieces of lab data are we going to take, and we're going to correlate the two, and then hopefully one will predict the other. That is the goal. Um, so why did we choose this path? I want to talk about that. Um, about nine months ago or ten months ago, we did sort of a whole study of the wide variety of options out there um, for, for what's the best strategy for us to try to um, identify food nutrition. Um, and there's, there's a couple, and these are, these are sort of like a couple that are out there. There's others. But we went through the kind of requirements that we felt we had to be successful to achieve that big goal that Dan talked about. And for each of these technologies, we kind of rated it and said, is this feasible or realistic? Um, this is called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. You basically shoot a laser at an object, and you, you see what the fire looked like. Um, and it uh, sounds great, but it's super expensive. It's really hard to interpret. Raman spectroscopy, some of you are probably familiar with that. Really cool, really promising, but it's just not, it's just not there yet. It's still too expensive, and it's still too hard to interpret. Um, reflectance is inexpensive. It's relatively easy to interpret, but there is still, calibration is still an issue. Um, so building that lab database is necessary for reflectance to work. And then finally, there are other options which down the road might be really useful. So, and this is a big point of this too, is we're not building this thing so this is the last thing that ever is going to exist. This is a process, right? We're establishing the process. So as new technologies come out, like wherever James is, um, as as other people much better and smarter than us come out with new and interesting things, we can integrate them into the system and get them out commercially as quickly as possible. Um, so we went through this process uh, and sort of decided that reflectance, for these reasons, was a good option. We also know that in the literature, there's a whole pile of support showing that um, reflectance in fruits and vegetables correlates to things like anthocyanins and carotenoids and freshness and a variety of other parameters. They've been done in a very one-off kind of way, right? So I can't say it's generally true for everything. But for specific compounds and specific things, it's there. So that's reason to believe that we can do this in a more general way. And then finally, we chose reflectance because it's actually a really good fit. It takes advantage of what the BFA has, which is a large community of people willing to put in some time and effort to send in samples. Because we need samples. That's a big piece of the cost here. Not developing the device, but building this uh, library. Also, um, because of my background in developing this, a lot of the technology was already done. We had a lot of technology done in the PhotoSync project, which I've been working on for four and a half or five years. So um, we were able to make this at a ridiculously low cost because uh, we took a lot of technology we already had. Um, okay, so. Where are we at? So if our strategy is we're going to do this, reflectance-based spectroscopy plus, um, plus a library, um, what do we need to do? One, we need to build the sensor and the software. Um, so we built this. We have two of these. Um, um, they work pretty well. We compared them to what we built before, uh, and we get roughly equivalent response. So I feel like we have a good device for proof of concept. Um, also, we as a company, our size as a company, is using the same thing in other applications, which means that we can share the development cost from the BFA to other applications and lower our cost. That's another way we try to lower the cost. And it's another benefit of being open source is you can take one thing and apply it to many different places. So it's cheaper for everybody. Um, so, and then we also built the software, which I'm not even going to show you, but that took a lot of hours and a lot of time and is also shared between applications. Software is incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, if you go to an app developer and say, hey, I have an app, how much does it cost to make? They're going to quote you somewhere between $200,000 and $400,000. Just the, the simplest, the things that you think are so simple are just ridiculously expensive. Um, so sharing those across multiple domains is really important. Um, so we built the sensor and the software, at least enough for proof of concept. Um, and then we actually need to do proof of concept on the idea that we can build a database of um, lab measurements and correlate that to spectra and get some predictive capacity that one will predict the other. So we spent a lot of time on that and that's where I'm going to hand it off to Dave. Um, let me make sure. To... 
Yeah. What elements are you scanning for? In reflectance? What elements are you scanning for? It says detect specific compound elements. This? We're not, we're, not, we're not looking at specific elements. Yeah, he's going he's gonna to talk to you about what, the, what those lab measurements we're correlating to are. Is this working? I don't believe it is. All right, I guess I'll yell. Is this one working? Yes, this one's working. All right. This is not ideal height, but all right. Well, that's good enough. Um, all right, so. Yeah, sure. Do you want this one, Dave? Hmm? Um, uh, oh, this will be fine. Okay. Thank you, because uh, you're going to jump in at points two, I think, towards the end. But all right, so I have the somewhat unenviable task of not inspiring you necessarily, but I get the job of uh, talking about defining food quality. And while we are going to uh, test that <coughs> with this, so just to just to, we're going to back up a second and kind of go where um, where Greg let uh, let us off. Which one of these is how you shop for carrots? Because that's what the experts think we should be worried about with carrot quality. Um, I mean, some of those things I have trouble pronouncing. I'm sure others here do as well. Uh, but these are all factors that nutritionists say are actually important to understanding and categorizing quality in carrots. Um, and I want to also mention, so part of the issue with defining food quality is that it's not one thing. So while a, a grocer might be interested in, in um, storability, uh, whether or not it rots before a consumer can pay for it, um, that's not necessarily what a chef is looking for who might want a specific flavor profile of an heirloom carrot, for instance. And that's probably totally different from what most people are interested in, which is, will my kids eat it? Um, <laughs> And so you can have you know, all the uh, free radical scavenging activity in the world, but if it's not, organs are actually really good at picking up a lot of these things. Um, and so the things that taste good generally are good for us. Otherwise, uh, we probably wouldn't have survived as a species this long. So that's a good thing. Uh, but it makes it difficult um, when you're shopping for things uh, because you can't really, they usually frown upon you tasting them before you've paid for them. So that's where the tool comes in very useful. Uh, now, lots of these compounds are very, very specific molecules. Uh, they take, they're very difficult to measure. They're expensive to measure. Uh, but the literature is, is telling us there's actually a lot of uh, correlations between many of these. And there's correlations between these specific compounds and larger sort of buckets of compounds. So um, we can look at categories like phenolics and proteins instead of looking at the specific compound. Um, and that's true of vitamins, it's true across the board. There are a lot of analogs that we can look at rather than having to look at the specific molecule. Um, and that's, we're lucky there, because if we couldn't do that, we'd be dead in the water. Um, and that's because they have yet to put um, uh, $100,000 lab equipment or a million dollar lab equipment into a tiny $5 sensor. Um, someday, maybe, but it's not there yet. Um, so, um, so this is so. It gets very tricky when we start looking at this uh, because no one agrees on what food quality is. Just talking about wine or grapes, for instance, um, it's different between table grapes and wine grapes. Uh, whether people are interested in lots of juice and not a lot, lots of juice but tough skins, which is would be like a table grape. Uh, a quality metric. And in wine grapes, it's um, oftentimes you know, a smaller berry with lower juice and a higher skin to juice ratio. So it really it depends on your market. It depends on the uh, um, opinion and the subjective opinion of, of the consumer. And so it gets a little tricky. Um, what we have done is gone to the literature and identified some of the measurement techniques that are more universally accepted for certain crops. And in carrots, some of those that we, we think that we can find uh, variation is phenolics, proteins, uh, minerals, and, um, and antioxidant levels. And so those are some buckets that we can look at. And the nice thing about those buckets and how we chose those is that we have actually inexpensive laboratory techniques to measure them. And there's a quite 
quite a wide range in the literature in, in carrots concentrations of those compounds. Give me that uh, list again. Phenolics, so total phenolics, total proteins, uh, minerals or elements, and then um, uh, yeah, what's antioxidants. The antioxidants, thank you. <laughs> um, and those are the first ones we're focusing on because those are the ones we can do very cheaply, we can do it ourselves. Uh, a plan, as, as Greg mentioned a few sl uh, slides ago, one of the big issues for our approach is the cost of calibration. Basically, in order for us to know what this is telling us, we need at least hundreds and probably thousands of data points. Because what it is really is um, we don't actually know. So what we see when we shine light at a, a carrot, for instance, and it bounces back, and we see a curve and a different response rate at each at each wavelength of light. We have no idea. We're not directly measuring any of those compounds. We're measuring a much more holistic sort of picture of what that carrot contains and how light responds to it. And until we can collect a lot of data to piece out what exactly we're looking at, what we're seeing in that spe um, spectrum, that we can't actually say whether one carrot's better than the other, whether one carrot has more phenolics, proteins, or anything else. Um, so, and I, m I didn't mention one other thing. We're, the, other, the other lab analysis we're doing is we're tasting everything. <laughs> Uh, and that's, that is an important piece, actually. There's a lot of variability in how carrots taste. Um, so that's the, um, the very high level, big picture, sort of why we're doing it the way we're doing it. Um, and I think I failed to. Yeah, so um, I've already talked about these. But one thing with a device like this is, um, and I mentioned this already, but I'll mention it again, it's really important. We need to see variation. So if every carrot looked identical in this, again, we'd be dead in the water. It you would know, be over. This whole exercise would be um, finished. Uh, but what we're seeing is, you know, this is not our um, spectrum data, uh, but our spectral data has similar levels of variability to this. This is uh, looking at total phenolic content of carrots that we tested in the lab. And the difference between this, because it's a purple carrot, um, and the difference between that and and this here, for instance, is uh, a well over order of magnitude difference in total phenolic content. So that variability that we're going to see in the carrots is really critical to finding differences here and correlating the two. And this, a similar picture emerges when we're looking at protein. And, uh, and so now what we need to do is do this a whole bunch of times. Um, and one way that we are, um, are going to do that is to actually set up our own uh, laboratory so that we can do our own testing. Um, the, this kind of nutritional testing. Could you speak in the yeah. mic, please? That one wasn't working. One, two, one, two. Oh, you're better than me. Uh, so. The, we, uh, when we started doing this, and w when we first came up with that picture of the different technologies and had the big red box for cost of calibration, uh, that was when we were looking at going out and finding commercial laboratories to run this for us. And to do these kind of relatively simple analyses of carrots, we're talking about like $500 per carrot. And um, I've been to Utah at a lab out there a couple times now, developing our own process for this, um, taking uh, standard procedures and adapting them to what we need to do for carrots. And we've got the we figure we get the cost down to below fifty dollars. So we've cut the cost by an order of magnitude in terms of the cost to get the data set we need to get to proof of concept and show that we've got something real here. Um, and the the final thing I want to mention in terms of you know, proof of concept, is that, frankly, I'd be shocked if we get it perfect the first time. Um, we, this is, as Greg was saying, it's a process. We want to engage a community of users, uh, a community of developers, community of farmers, to help us build this out, expecting that this is iterative, expecting that today, this is what we came up with. We have our 10 light, 10, um, wavelengths of light, we have our sensors. Uh, the, the, the chip manufacturers have already talked to us and said, uh, 
tell us what frequencies of light you want to look at and we'll build the chips for you. Um, there are, the chip manufacturers are constantly working to uh, lower the cost and in, improve the uh, variation of, of sensors that, they're on, that they offer. And so I thoroughly expect that this will change over time. Um, but in order to do that, we're going to need all of your help. We're going to need money. And we're also going to need carrots and other produce, <laughs> uh, lots of them. Um, I'll buy the carrots. What is that? I'll provide carrots. Great. Um, yeah, so, Greg, is that? Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah. You've got the. You've got yeah, the, I'll go from there. Sure. Um, uh, so, 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 I, to, to recap, the, the outcome is um, uh, we need a lot of samples. Samples are expensive if we outsource them. Uh, when we came up with our definition of quality, which is not the be-all, end-all, but it's a good start, those four things that you talked about, we can do that in-house for a lot cheaper. Also, we're, doing, we're in the development phase. So uh, if every time you want to go take a sample, so we've got to fly to Utah and it takes six months to set it up, it's going to be a slow development process. <laughs> so we've got to have those capabilities in-house. Um, so I think that's really exciting. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's kind of, uh, I didn't have like a fancy ending, um, but um, <laughs> that's where we're at. So I guess uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the future, um, we did get this uh, money, um, which we'll put towards building a lab. Um, it's not going to be a complicated lab. I think what, oh, I, I did have one more slide. This is, this is what I want to, nope, 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 um, see for the future. So um, this is what's exciting to me. So in other work, we're working on measuring soil carbon using the same kind of device. Um, and that's actually a lot more, that proof of concept is already done. So we know we can do that reasonably well. Um, and uh, what I'm excited about is building a lab where we can measure these four things that we talked about for food. And then we could say, take the dirt that that food was grown in and measure these three things. Soil carbon, which we know relates to soil quality in a very general way. I, I, I fully, un I, this is not a replacement for you sending stuff to, to soil testing labs. We are in no way trying to replace soil testing and food quality labs. We will never, we're, because we'll never compete with them and we don't have the technical skills and initial investment to make that work. But we can address very specific questions which I think are of interest to this community, which is how does soil quality connect with food quality, right? How can we track at a high level those things? Um, soil carbon we know relates to soil quality. We have a really nice and easy and cheap test to do soil biological activity, um, which I can, I can show you if you want. And then minerals, because we can use the same tool for measuring minerals in both places, so that helps us keep the cost low. And I think, and we've you know run the numbers on this. I think we can do this whole thing for easily under a hundred bucks, probably fifty bucks in terms of cost, which is cool. So, in building this little lab, we can calibrate our tool. We can answer these core questions about what is the spectrum of variation in in the world because it's not well answered, and we can provide low cost testing for BFA numbers, which I think has value for your own farms and your own curiosity at the same time helps us build this data set. So this is what we're looking to do this year. Build this out, get the proof of concept in place, continue to iterate on the technology um, so that we're ready in a year to have a, um, a beta device that people can actually use and play with at home. And then the other thing too is the getting into the crowdsourced scientific research is once these devices are out there, you all can be the scientists. Exactly. And once the the once the device is calibrated, we understand how it works and how it responds. Um, we can all, you can also, uh, we're also building out the tool to share that data or uh, the platform to share that data, tied in with PharmOS, um, so that this stuff flows like right through to how you're managing your farm, so that we can tie some of these metrics and then your soil samples and then everything else you do to the final end quality of what you're growing. And that's like that's the that's the end state we're going for. So that you can you can be a researcher, you can um, take uh, take control of your technological future, take control of your food quality, have the data, 
open, transparent as you want and, and owned by you as opposed to um, you paying to access your own data, which is the model in many ways now, and build this transparent system of engagement amongst a, a community. So that's the, that's, this is just one piece and I just wanted to finish off by mentioning just how it ties in. Um, it's not just, you know, about building a gizmo, um, it's tied in with engaging a whole community around this. So, any questions? It just seems like the third leg on a stool in the wild card is, is the atmospheric conditions. So atmospheric data logging of the conditions of the gentleman that was that the people have presented before they, they covered a lot of that. Yep. So is, are you? Can you encourage people to take that into account? I, I can speak to that a little bit. So um, there's actually multiple ways to get to that. Um, so like Dorn was talking about before, having these broader connections and APIs connecting one person's database or sensors to another. Um, you can get that information on a mile by mile basis now on a daily basis. Now does that tell you in your specific field or under that specific tree? No, it gives you an average. Um, but you can access that information through APIs and we can include that in the database. So you have it as a reference point for every data point you collected. Um, uh, that's one. Two. Um, it's just temperature and relative humidity. Those are very easy to measure. You know, it's like a $2 sensor that goes on here. Uh, we did that with PhotoSync too. This has temperature and relative humidity measures. So you're always getting that in real time at the point of measurement. Um, that would be useful from a, from a farmer perspective, less useful in the grocery store because I don't think you care what the temperature is in the grocery store. But yeah. And then when you, the two options. When you talk about farm OS and what can integrate there, the sky's the limit in terms of sensor data. So there's relatively inexpensive CO2 sensors, there's uh, temperature, humidity, rain sensors, wind gauges, uh, literally whatever you can imagine you'd want to sense can be can uh, feed automatically into Farm OS and into a database that's then searchable and you know you could actually look at in one field year to year what the variability is in terms of um, uh, climate and see how it impacts your results. Um, Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, yep. Sure. Um, he said um, uh, there might be people who want to poke hole in the, in the technology. So how do you ensure that um, validation is done in a way where you can address those concerns? Is that basically? Um, <clears throat> I think there's two key ways. One you do before, and one you do after. The one you do before is pe people like to poke holes in things because they're used to black boxes showing up on stores, right? And then it's everyone gets to poke holes at black boxes because you don't know anything about it. And like, why not? That's not what we're doing here. So step one is to be clear in our intent and in our process that we are developing as a community. So being public is messy. And people have to accept that this is a messy process. Um, and I think as long as we're honest about that, that will help diffuse some of that. To say, like, we're not delivering you a black box, so don't treat it like one. Um, uh, that's one. Uh, and then two. Um, I think we'll just do as, as good a job as we can possibly do in, um, in validating the device in the lab. I mean, if you're talking about running a thousand samples, we should be able to know how many samples do we need to, um, you know, say <laughs> with a reasonable level of confidence that something is true or not. And if someone wants to repeat the results, all the data will be public, the processes will be public, and off they go. So I expect to hold ourselves to the same um, standards in terms of the quality of experiments that somebody would do in academia. I am not going to spend six months or higher. Or higher. <laughs> I'm just true. <laughs> Given the repeatability crisis in science right now, but um, uh, but I'm not going to spend six months um, uh, submitting to a journal that I'm going to go back and forth on. That's a waste of my time. But it is not a waste of my time to hold ourselves to that same level of expectation. So that's.
And then with transparency, I mean, that's part of it. It's just if everything's transparent and any, everyone can see exactly what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we made the decisions we did, then if they don't, first of all, if they don't like it, they can fork the project, take our source code, take our design, build their own that they think is better. Um, hopefully they'll do that in an open way. And, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and that we can all grow from that and build off of that. Can I just say a few things? Just, um, so the questions are good. Um, we've, I'm, I know I've seen some people here glazing over um, who don't particularly like such heady science techie talk. Um, just a couple <laughs> in the audience. Um, well, I think we've, we've laid out in broad strokes um, the details of what we're up to and the you know, philosophical framework. And you can see that the, you know, the, the people, um, and I'm, if we have about 20 minutes until lunch. Um, so I think this is a good opportunity. Maybe if, I'm not sure if Doran and Mike, you guys want to come up and um, we can sort of broadly, broadly field um, questions about where this whole project stands. Um, there's certainly going to be time uh, for the rest of the day and for the next two days for um, technical, detailed questions that might be more appropriate for individuals to be asking other individuals. Um, but the idea here uh, today is to sort of open the space more broadly for the conceptual framework and the strategy and to see where people's, um, you know, how it sets, uh, you know, where it stands. So I would say just feel free to engage um, more broadly in these last 20 minutes before, before lunch. And speak loudly? OK. <laughs> uh, yes? So how are you approaching, um, on the user end of things, the differences and variations in produce? So for example, a carrot is very easy because you eat the carrot. For something like a melon, you're shooting the rind, you're shooting the light spectrum of the rind versus the side of the nutrient. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the reality is we have to take this one carrot at a time. <laughs> um, one crop at a time. One How about, about a banana? Time. Yeah. You know, or an orange. Exactly. They're not, and, and in fact, even, even Repeat the question. That, the question, sorry. Sorry. Uh, how do you deal with the fact that different, um, uh, different fruits and vegetables are very different in terms of shape? Um, and, and what parts you eat. And what what we understand eat, yeah. is that um, the biochemistry of the crop you know, there's patterns basically between the surface and the in, and the and the and the internal aspect, and so um, this is, as Greg was saying, the biggest you know cost here is building the data sets to actually tease out the correlations and the patterns, so that we can simply say, looks like 85% odds. This is, you know, at 80% on the continuum. Um, there's reams and reams and reams of information out there, um, which we can use to guide our process. But really, um, it has not been built out in one big open collaborative framework. This is part of the strategic issue um, that I actually was really um, happy to hear acknowledged at the USDA in Beltsville in BC last year. Was they're saying, you know, we think there's a connection between soil health and plant health and crop quality and maybe even human health, but the way we do science is such that we can't figure it out. Because you have researchers that are focusing on this question here, and this question here, and this question here, and they've got independent databases and independent you know, frameworks of, of data collection, we do not have this big open collaborative framework for actually teasing all this stuff together. And what's really exciting right now is that there seem to be a lot of you know, young Turks you know, in the research community, um, you know, inside all these organizations that people maybe have negative associations with who do really mean well and how are coming up against this boundary and saying the only way we can actually move this conversation forward is through big open data um, collaborative processes. So um, yeah, there's, there's so much, you know, so many data points here that suggest and that suggests and that suggests and like we can connect the dots and say it looks really likely that this is what's going on. But until this framework is established, until this data is collected in this, in this manner, in this collaborative manner, we really can't say anything with confidence. And that's why if anybody's been looking for this information to be um, confirmed in the peer-reviewed literature, it doesn't exist. Right? We do not have the confirmation of all these things that we, most of us in this room, hold like we know this is true, but we don't have the data, is because the way it's been framed, the way the question's been framed, framed the way the research has been structured is such that, that we can't formally say it in the peer-reviewed literature. So our, our, our design is to accomplish 
is to accomplish that, to be really to sort of meet the scientists on their, on their you know, playing field and say, look, let's go. We got this. <laughs> and I, I want to answer specifically, too. Like, there will be certain things that we can't measure non-destructively. They'll just be too hard. So um, we think for now. Things, right, for now. But um, some things you'll have to chop up. You know, um, some things won't work at all. So part of this process is figuring out what we can do and how well we can do it. And then what the version 2 needs to have to get to that next level of capability. Yeah, understanding. The Lionel? So how many crops will you uh, be focusing on in the next year? Uh, I would like to focus on two. Although it depends the on the size of the your... Of this goes. True. The check you're writing us. That's basically... Yeah. That's this is... Do you know what they'll be, the two crops? Uh, mm, yeah, it's carrots and spinach. And, we'll, and what are the other parameters that you'll be asking... Uh, people who submit yeah. produce great question. Provide. That's exactly the right question. So you said, what other parameters are you asking people to provide? So a bit, the bit, the the um, the kind of like dirty secret of this is that uh, the the spectra matter, but the metadata, which is the other parameters that you would provide, probably matter as much, if not more. Knowing where it came from, what time of year it was, potentially like. Who produce? Who is the producer? You know, what's the name on the bag, or what's the QR code? That'd be interesting to do it um, if there were QR codes. Um, How long ago was it harvested? Exactly. So that metadata is going to be probably as predictive as the spectra itself. And and that's why, like, that's where PharmOS would be really handy. So rather than you as someone sending in carrot samples or spinach samples telling us all that in a in a form, you would just link it to the field that's associated with their PharmOS account and tell and say. This is where it came from. All of that data. <laughs> and I just so want to make it a lot simpler. I want to say something about your question about how many crops are we going to be looking at and how fast is this, you know, this going to occur. Um, you know, we've written out grant proposals for $100,000, $150,000, you know, two crops, three crops over a couple of years. Um, with our limited, really limited capacity um, as well-meaning, underfunded, you know, operations, we can only operate at this speed. We can only really take on a couple crops in a year. Um, that does not mean that we can only take on a couple crops in a year. That means that only through a much broader, deeper collaboration can we move this forward rapidly. Yeah. And that's the real idea of this whole endeavor is to say, guys, look, here is the vision. Here is the structure. Who wants to help out? Um, there are so many allies who have the capacity to move this forward dramatically. Um, but only when we actually engage in a collaborative manner is that going to occur. This will take a long time if it's just us well-meaning, you know, visionary, you know, underfunded organizations. It's only when we collaborate with the already existing infrastructure and those capacities that this thing moves rapidly. Richard? I'd buy a $1,000 unit if it's going to have glycine in it. Are you going to have that frequency? <laughs> Probably so not. The, the question is parts per no. billion, parts per trillion, parts per million. Um, yeah, toxins versus nutrition. There's so many people willing to give us lots of money to test toxins. Exactly. Um, Man, if we had a solution for that. Uh, and we, we could, <laughs> right? I mean, but that's not the point. Right. The point is the quality of the, of the crop. Right. The point is the nutritional value. The point is the carbon sequestration. The point is the ecosystem benefits. And by fighting the negative, we're never going to get there. The point is by building the solutions is, is I mean, yeah. Generate money. If you have <laughs> Yeah. No, so it does not directly measure minerals. Right. That's the that is something fundamental that everyone needs to understand. It does not measure elements. There's actually yeah. it's actually very well. It will never, as it is now designed, ever measure elements directly. Okay. Now there may be ways of correlating it to certain certain minerals or mineral ratios, um, but we in our in the lab the the the, the correlation and calibration work we're doing. We're going to use XRF, which is X-ray fluorescence, to measure elements in like 90 seconds. You get all of them, right. um, and so that's how we're going to build the correlation with our with our tool. But it's never going to directly measure elements, and so the key is going to be: Does glyphosate have a signature? Does it have a change that's sort of a signatory? So it it always has a specific change to the spectrum we actually can see, and we won't know that until we have a lot of data points in our data set. The likelihood is that glyphosate, we know, ties up, you know, manganese, cobalt, copper, zinc. We know those are 
the elements that are the core of certain enzymes. We know those enzymes are used to build certain compounds. We can see when those compounds aren't present, because those elements aren't present, then there's a causal factor. So it really gets back to the metadata, which is, I think, probably what glosses over a lot of people. So I don't want to go too far down that track if it's okay. <laughs> well, the practical matter about lunch, I have found yeah. the one deli in walking area, and if you're interested in going to that deli because you don't have a reservation here, come talk to me. <laughs> can, wait, can I add one more thing to that, uh, to, to, to the previous question? Um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is it's, um, whether or not the tool can measure a specific thing now isn't the critical point, right? So in five or ten years, other people not in this room are going to be um, pulling data about our food system in real time in the same way that we're talking about. And those will be private companies that are doing that for their own reasons. And I'm not saying they're nefarious, but they're going to have their own reasons and intentions. So we have the opportunity now to create a culture in the space around our food system as immense amounts of information start to emerge, like you're seeing from Pharma West and many other projects not represented in this room, to say the culture in this space is sharing first. Right? If we establish that culture, then it doesn't matter what comes next because the culture is established so that we can all benefit from that information. If we don't establish that culture, you're going to end up with silos of information and companies controlling it and parsing it out to you at a specific rate, which maximizes their benefit. And, and part of the strategy to that is if we build out the collaborative platform well enough, then it will actually be in everyone's financial and, um, and, and basically every interest to work within that system and share because they can actually see a quicker development of what they're trying to accomplish. Right. So the, you know, the big corporate researchers are going to possibly end up putting data in our system and sharing it because by doing that, they can actually achieve faster development work of their own. So that's the, that's what we're trying to, we're trying to get out ahead of that so that um, that becomes basically the standard of how we operate. Yeah. And you're seeing it, like the SPAR yeah. conference was like an amazing example of a $200 million government-funded nonprofit where the de facto, the change in the discussion, I think, yeah. Joan can talk to that. I'd just like to add, part of that discussion, we have an ally, I think, in that in unlikely places where we have uh, the Soil Health Partnership, which is represented by folks like the Iowa Corn Growers Association that are are talking about sharing data across their operations. So the soil health movement is shifting the conversation away from, I think, this, this what can we do productively together from what do we have to try and stop. And I think that's, that's where we're going to make a lot of progress. It doesn't mean that you have to stop trying to stop things that are harmful, but this is where we're seeing some broad coalitions coming together with unlikely uh, allies um, so I think that's, that's a really important point. And like I said, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned on the panel, where a few years ago you would have been laughed out of the room saying we're talking about soil life and soil health. Uh, now you have folks at a conference sponsored by Bayer talking about the microbiome in plant roots and soil health. So right. it's, you know, so it's not, it's, it, I think this is part of the sort of our... Uh, what does success look like? <laughs> and how do we then guide it in a direction that we want to see? And, and like you said, I think this is where it really is modeling and developing the platforms and taking action, being the, being the lion in the mirror, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. That's a great topic. <laughs> uh, Len? Well, actually, it's a great question. What does success look like? So uh, my question is, in the, at the end of the day, you're going to end up with a whole lot of data from a whole lot of farms and a whole lot of species a whole lot of variation. So to me, we have to, to add to the question about what success looks like. We have to go back to what you said in the beginning. Ultimately, you have to make a correlation between those variations and the growing conditions and the soil so that you could say, well, if you grow it this way, then you get that. And the minimum data that you uh, are offering to collect in the soil, which was the, uh, the respiration and uh, carbon and minerals. Mm -hmm. I don't think is enough. I think 
a lot more has to be done on that to make the ultimate correlation uh, to the next we're after. That's what Farm West is doing. Farm West is, you know, establishing the capacity to, to monitor soil type, fertility program, management practice, cultivars, epigenetics, you know, yield, pest and disease resistance. The platform, <laughs> Farm West, is established to monitor all that stuff. Then we can correlate that to the results. This is a, it's a big, open, broad, conceptual framework for collaboration. And this is the, this is the heavy lifting, conceptually, is to see how it's all actually deeply synergistic. Um, and this is our struggle you know, talking to, you know, the mainstream consciousness is getting this thought conveyed. This is what I said, you know, I will consider this day to be successful if people can grok this concept. That only by this deep, broad, collaborative endeavor are we going to be able to move this, move forward systemically. We're used to thinking for ourselves, thinking for our, our limited self-interests, um, thinking for, you know, this in our little boxes. And, you know, I we were talking about this, the structure of the movement and the strategy, it's mycelial, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a broad network. Only when we actually can mimic nature strategically in our function as a community, as a society, are we going to be able to achieve the vitality that nature you know, has, shows us the potential for. As long as we're in our reductionist boxes here and there, we're going to continue our, our downward path you know, globally, as far as I'm concerned. David? Out because there's a lot of excitement. We all want to see this happen faster than yeah. crops in a year. And so please help us by giving us some handfuls on how to network for support for what you're doing. So what I heard so far from all of you is that more money and more samples will make it go faster. There's an upward limit of that. Maybe you can talk about what you have the capacity to do if you add more money and samples now. Yeah. And then what that ceiling looks like financially and some samples in the next so many. Just give us some specifics, because then maybe you can go faster. Uh, I would say let's, um, uh, I, I can give you some now, but I really think we should try to tie that up really nicely by the end of the day, so that we have very, very clear contact points for you guys. We talked about that actually before this, but, um, but I, I think we should really focus on that by the end of the day um, to, to do that. Funding is obviously one. Of the, it, it expands by having more people. We can do more. But, but you're right. I think having partners who know how to collect samples effectively that we can trust, I and mean, that's a key piece of this, is don't send me a sample that's 20 weeks old and screw up the metadata. Like, we really need to make sure that we have people that, that we can be confident about that's going to contribute successfully. So let's make sure we do that by the end of the day. So it seems like in the initial stages of developing the gizmo, you're targeting uh, fruits and vegetables. A day when this could be used to analyze animal proteins, both land and seed? As far as I'm concerned, milk, meat, you know, eggs, cheese, rice, um, the principles of spectroscopy are that every thing in chemistry, every element, every compound in chemistry is a vibration in physics. So protein in beans, protein in apples, protein in beef is still protein. So there's no reason at all why we can't read the spectral signature of anything. Um, yeah, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, absolutely. That is the, that is the uh, agenda. Um, it's just a question of, you know, I'm not sure if you get the gist off of us that we're not corporate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we got it. Yeah, so, I mean, really it's a question of, you know, we're envisioning an entirely different way of going about this. And we've been, we've been holding this idea and we've been moving it forward to the best of our ability. And when we came together a year ago, you know, we had a, we had a piece, you know, Greg had a piece, Dorn and Mike had a piece. We were like, hey, guys. And we were all basically trying to do our little pieces to the best of our ability. We were like, hey, if we work together, we can do a lot more. And we've gotten a lot more done in the past year. And our idea here is that actually there's a massive amount of individuals, organizations, networks, capacity that we can swing into this thing. Um, and it's really up to us to move it forward as fast as possible. And so... You know, I think, you know, just broadly that the wintertime, I mean, the by the night people talk about this, the crystallization period, my, you know, deepest insights come around the winter solstice. Like, that's when the deep thinking happens, that's when the visioning happens. You know, the farming conferences, we, we, we strategically placed this conference in late fall because all the farming conferences are going to happen over the next three months, right? We want this buzz, this percolation, this, you know, this just sort of, just digestion percolation process to occur um, 
it's really incumbent on us. You know, if not us, who? If not now, when? You see where we're at, right? We're not we're not hiding anything. You can you can you can get a read on where we're at. You get the vision. Um, it's up to us to engage this process. And anybody who wants to take ownership of that, um, that's what we're here for. We strategically placed this event at the beginning of the conference so that we can all get to know each other and we can talk and we can cross pollinate and cross fertilize over the conference. This afternoon, we've got you know, the structured time for that process to begin. Um, this really is an organic process. We are not trying to control it. We're holding space for it. Um, it's, it's all relationships. It's all relationships and, and collective self-interest. So, um, Can I yeah. clarify the answer? I just want to make sure you get exactly right. <laughs> Not that that wasn't good. I just want to, I don't, I don't want to overstep things. Um, you can't see everything with spectroscopy. It's just one tool to see things. There are interesting applications that aren't currently, like a good example is um, Organic Valley. Uh, you know, they, 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 they have a method for using, uh, measuring um, fluorescence fluorescing proteins in milk to see how grass-fed the cow was that produced the milk. And that's a really interesting method. It's very specific, um, but it's interesting. So there will be opportunities like that in other spaces, but they'll require their own development process. And, that kind of stuff. and if we have the open platform for data collection and sharing, all these different, there's, there's drones that are flying over. I mean, there's all kinds of technologies that we can integrate into this collaborative process. And I, and I think that's that's the point I wanted to make when we're talking about scaling, is that we need to. It's really about scaling the network and building for adapting to the changing technology. Because the what we're using today is not what we're going to be using in six months, uh, not to mention five years. So we need to build systems that are adaptive to that changing environment and that are modular and that we can swap in and the, the legacy data, the legacy work that we've done. Can, can plug in, but it's really about building a network that is adaptive to that change. Mm -hmm. And so that is really bringing your own networks into the culture of collaboration. Kind of like uh, uh, that, that uh, the Greg's presentation I think did a nice job of that. Learning to collaborate is work, but then we can accomplish these great things. But we need to be able to uh, learn to adapt. Anybody ever tilled the ground? You know what happens to the mycorrhizal fungi when you till it up? It takes a little while. Yeah, genocide, I call it. <laughs> it takes a little while for those mycelial hyphae to reconnect. Right? That's where we're at as a society, as a culture. We're disconnected. We need to frame, we need to, you know, calm down and, and reconnect. And if we can uh, agree to frame that structure to, you know, to establish that network, um, it's gonna. It looks like it's slow for a little bit, but systemically, foundationally, we are revitalizing the ecosystem. That's really where we're at. We're, we're we're biomimicry. You know, how does nature do it? How can we organize collaboratively on an entirely different framework? It's a paradigm shift. It really takes it takes a shift in consciousness, and that's what we're we're proposing here. Christopher. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, you can host it yourself. It's essentially like a website, so you, you would, you know, pay a, a server to host that system. Um, and But all those modules are free, so you could just download them and install them in addition to the, the base system. The sensors, the oh. question about the sensors, and the point is that basically where we're at right now is establishing the functionality with all the sensors to the, to the hardware, you know, the, the hardware to the software. And when Dorn had that you know, graph here, it said it's $25,000 per farm for the first 10, and then it's $10,000 per farm for the next 100, and then it's $1,000 per farm for the next 1,000, and at 10,000 farms, it was down here next to nothing. So where we're at right now is we have to actually build out that you know, capacity to overlay the hardware to the software and take the expensive sensors now and figure out what the core components are and, and say, okay, really, this sensor costs $200 now, but it's really a 20 cent sensor. And, what, and this is the process, is we have to integrate all these different components into an ecosystem. And that's where we're at. We're, at, we're, at the, we're really early on in this, in this process. And you know, I think you know, in two years, basically, if we work together, 
this whole platform is operational, functional, we've got the data, we've got the hardware, we've got the metrics, we've got the ne network. And I really think we're like two years out from, from you know, a, a global platform of functionality. I think that's realistically where we're at. The other question was, have you guys done SWOT analysis to see actually what your devices are already out there if you're trying to recreate the wheel, like Forse or Brickros or these other companies that already have devices that are just not cost-effective for a consumer to access? Yeah, yeah. There, um, we've looked at a lot of other devices and devices that are coming out, you know, keeping track of technology. Um, uh, actually, in the soil carbon space is a really, really interesting one. There's some really good stuff being done in the private sector. I actually was going to mention that before, but there's some great work being done in the private sector. Um, the issue is it's still, it's still proprietary. <laughs> so in the end of the day, you're still talking about either having someone sell you technology that you can't look in, or having someone sell you technology that's open, but then they're taking the data and you can't look at that. So my answer still one way or the other is we need a fully open system. That's just my opinion. There's an amazing amount of stuff being done by really good people using the traditional model. And the more we you know, scale up the system, the more of those good people are going to say, hey, you know what? Um, <laughs> this is what I really want to do. I just was operating in this, in this other paradigm. Yep. It's, it's, it's noontime now. Bob, you want to just get the last question and we'll call it for, call it for lunch? We just don't have enough mics here. Yeah, I'm one of those farmer, agronomist, researcher types, and I've got a group of friends. We're working on some projects in Iowa right now, but what we're doing is emphasizing soil quality through the Haney score PLFA work. And anyhow, what we're doing is throwing out different products that are commercially available, uh, say biopesticides, signaling compounds, what have you. But we're raising some 270 to 411 bushel corn on fields that have a CSR of 31 to 45. Yeah, very poor. But what we're doing then is at the end of the season, uh, we're using the X-ray diffraction meter, and we are analyzing the kernels on the ear, every inch from the butt to the tip, <laughs> for all 94 different minerals. So we've got a lot of answers. Now we're wondering what the questions are. <laughs> but That's, we, people it, like this all over the planet that we're actually in pretty good relationship with. Yeah. So the, the framework, we all dump everything into So we we were having conversation with Joe Clapperton. We asked how far away is it where you, we can take your X-ray diffraction meter and put it on the front end of a high clearance sprayer and at the back end you've got a sprayer with a boom that's got direct injection on it and you're applying the exact minerals that the crop is asking for and she said we've already got it designed but then we're tying that all into human health also so what Rich is going to say is very important because the environmental health doctors are tracking most chronic diseases to a mineral deficiency so it all ties together. All right. But instrumentation is critical. <laughs> Collaboration. So it's, we're a little afternoon. The schedule says we're breaking now for lunch. Uh, hopefully, this opportunity to be able to uh, you know, yeah. spend time together talking. Um, we're going to have a little bit of uh, um, people from the audience um, who you'll be impressed by, uh, like some of the people you've already met here. Um, offering their commentary, and then we'll break out and try to capture as many people's insights and suggestions as possible this afternoon. Hope you all had a good morning. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs>